So welcome to the Ed Morrissey Show. Great to have you with us. And, Thank you. Great to have you too. And uh, so first off, the 1619 Project, I, I have to tell you, this is a fun story for me because I had known that this was sort of, you know, uh, sort of nonsense. I'd read some of it and I was, I'm not a... I'm not a historian, but I knew enough to know that this was really uh, misdirected uh, and and certainly cooked. Um, I was looking around for a really good rebuttal to this, and for some reason I didn't first go to heritage.org, which I should have done because you'd already done some work on this. Instead, I went to that well-known def- well-known website that's known for its defense of American heritage, capitalism, and uh, and uh, Civil Liberties, the World Socialist website. Wait a minute, did I get that right? Yeah, the World Socialist website, which actually did a pretty good job <laughs> of finding actual um, actual experts to talk about this. So kudos to them for this. But I said I, I've got to get I've got to get somebody on from Heritage to talk about this. So thank you so much, Arthur, for uh, being with us today. Of course, my pleasure. Did you read the Did you read the uh, the interviews at the World Socialist? I gotta ask. Did you Did you read those interviews? Uh, well, look, I did, and <laughs> you know, I'm just as surprised as you are. Uh, but it is good to know that even among that crowd, there are honest people who, yes. you know, kind of care about the facts and are interested in investigating. And they interviewed some of the most prominent historians of the American founding. I mean, Gordon Wood is a household name. And what shocked me about the interviews is not so much that they can falsify the New York Times' narrative, we all kind of already know the arguments about that, but that they weren't even consulted. Right. So the most prominent historians in America, and by the way, Gordon Wood is not a notorious conservative. You know, he's, in a sense, a man of the left. He wasn't even consulted. He was surprised by this. Uh, And it's an indication to me how the extent to which this is not a very serious project. It's a kind of propaganda campaign uh, to use the pages of the New York Times, its reputation, to impress impressionable minds who will then in turn use the curriculum that's been developed on the basis of that narrative in middle schools and high schools throughout the country. You know, and and I should introduce you properly to Arthur. Arthur uh, is the Associate Director of the Heritage Foundation's B. Kenneth Simon Center for Principles and Politics. He oversees the center's research portfolio and gives talks on the tenets of the American political tradition to policymakers, political leaders, and the public. And before you were at Heritage, and uh, when you joined in 2014, you worked uh, for the House Armed Services Committee and at the Hudson Institution, another fine uh, conservative think tank, and you've been published in lots of different places. We'll, we'll, we'll just send people over to heritage.org to, to look at the rest of your CV, Arthur. But, uh, you know, this what really concerns me most about this, uh, there are two things about this, uh, before we get into what actually went wrong in their analysis. One is that uh, this is sort of a self-serving narrative for the New York Times. They're, they're, it, it points to a direction there where they're really going to be about demagoguery on race and um, and uh, policy rather than enlightening people. And, but the, the more important thing to me is that they're planning on using the 1619 Project to craft school curricula. And I believe, is it the city of Chicago that's already adopted this as its school curricula for, um, for history? That's what I've heard as well. And that's maybe the first one, and there will be more to follow. Right. That's the scary thing. I, look, I would, I would take a step back and point out this, that the whole point of this project is to say that America is fundamentally racist in its DNA and that the two main documents on the basis of, of which America was built, the Declaration and the Constitution, are therefore morally nullified. We cannot right. be ruled by them. And so here's where that gets us into. It means that we are morally at sea as a nation, especially those that believe in the Declaration and the Constitution as our guiding principle. And if we are morally at sea, we must look for a moral authority who can guide us. And that moral authority is the New York Times. The New York Times wants to get rid of our history so that it can dictate our future. It can tell us what is right and wrong, what is morally evil, what we should liberate ourselves from or rebel against so that it can guide us as a nation. So let's start to get to the 1619 Project itself. If people haven't read the 
the uh, Grant Wood, or Gordon Wood, not Grant Wood, Grant Wood was a famous American painter. Uh, Gordon Wood interview at the uh, World Socialist website. They haven't read two or three other interviews that those guys did that were really excellent interviews about the same topic. Where does this project go wrong, historically speaking? What what are the base assumptions that start that start them down the primrose path here? Well, honestly, it's a bit hard to know where to begin because there really is so much wrong there. And I don't speak as, uh, you know, uh, a guy that's bragging about knowing so much. It's that it really gets a lot wrong. Right. And it was okay with getting a lot wrong, which is why it didn't consult Gordon Wood. Had Gordon Wood been on that project, half of it would have been axed. So here are some of the main things. Um, number one, they claim outrageously, without any citations, that the American Revolution was fought to preserve slavery. Right. There is not a single source. If you look at the founding documents, the, right, the writings of the main founders, there is not a single source which would indicate the truth of that or, or even support it. So that's one absolutely outrageous claim. Another is the implication that all of our founders basically were white nationalists who wanted to preserve slavery. When you look at the writings of every single major founders, every single one, none of them support slavery, and in fact, all of them condemn it as evil. Not a single one says that this is a good thing. And you can build on that very easily by seeing that when they say all men are created equally, they mean all human beings. If they were white supremacists, why did they have zero arguments in any of their writings that say, well, natural rights are only for white people? They do the opposite. Madison says very carefully that he avoided using the word slave in the Constitution so as to underline the humanity of slave. The Constitution calls slaves persons. They are always persons because it's very clear that they also possess natural rights and at some point will be liberated from their bondage. Right. And I mean, th that certainly they certainly miscast the founders. They miscast actually uh, a significant part of the American population at the time as well. The, the yes. northern states popular sentiment had already swung over to abolition. And, you know, John Adams was a was was a well-known abolitionist, was part of that was part of that movement. Uh, there was tension between that's one of the things that created tension between the southern states and the northern states during um, during both the revolution and in the Constitutional Convention. And you know, they, they ended up crafting compromises, which in retrospect are extremely unfortunate. But if the compromises hadn't been reached, uh, there wouldn't have been a constitution. There wouldn't have been a, an American uh, state. It would have um, it, the, the the whole thing would have collapsed. And one of the things that I think that I think it was Gordon Wood who said this is that everybody involved in this thought that slavery would be over in 20 years. That the that the that the even the economic model wasn't going to work for the South for another generation, and that. They just wrote all these things with with the idea in mind that slavery was on its last legs, which didn't turn out to be true, right? But but that was what this was written in, in mind of. And I, I found that argument very compelling, and I hadn't heard that before. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, there's a lot to unpack in what you said. Um, first of all, on the economic model, everybody understood that slavery was not very productive labor. It simply wasn't. Tocqueville observes this when he comes to, Amer uh, to America in 1835. He says that I am uh, passing on the Mississippi River and on one side is Ohio and on one side is Kentucky. Ohio, a non-slave state, there is the bustle of commerce. There, are, there is smoke coming out of some kind of productive facilities. And on the other side, where there is slavery, there is overgrown grass and a couple of slaves barely tending the fields. That's a nice little representation of how everybody at the time understood that this was not productive labor, that it was the North that was the economic engine uh, of, of the nation. On a couple of the constitutional compromises that you described, first of all, Frederick Douglass understood that mm -hmm. slavery was going to come to an end in one of two ways. Either 
the North would impose its economic system and its natural rights regime onto the South, and eventually slavery would be smuggled out, or there would be a just war. And uh, the problem was that nobody believed that if the South was left to its own devices, i.e. not in a union, that the South would ever give up slavery. In right. fact, at that point, they would have no interest in giving up slavery. The Constitution, I would also add, has several clauses which very clearly show that there was a motive to get rid of slavery. The classic, famous, and just obvious in-your-face example is Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1, which says that slavery, uh, the importation of slaves, can be banned beginning in 1808. On the very first day that that was possible, Jefferson signed that law into existence. There was a broad understanding that slavery was unjust, that it was bad for the nation, and that it would re eventually require uh, eradication. One of the other aspects that's brought up, and this is less about the founders and it's less about um, the revolution, but it's more about the world in which this existed, is, and, and all three, I think, of the historians that, um, the, that were interviewed at the... <laughs> World Socialist website. And again, I, I'm laughing. They did a very nice job. They really did. And I, I, I was very impressed. Surprisingly. By the yeah, absolutely. And, and they. And They're good for them. Good for them. Absolutely. I, my laughter is about myself. It's not about those guys. They did a good job. Um, but um, it's important to remember that in 1619 and in 17, 1776 as well, is that slavery was a global phenomenon it was not peculiar to the west it was not peculiar to the uh, to the colonies certainly and the british government was still by the way engaging in slave trade they they would they would dump it before we did but they were still engaging in slave trade at that particular point in time so if the american revolution was a way to preserve slavery it seems a very strange thing to do to separate from the british empire which would arguably have at least protected those interests especially in the south right if that was the, the motivation was the south would have stuck with the with the british in, in in those circumstances but this is a global phenomenon in 1619 and in 1776 and really the only voices for abolition are coming out of england and the colonies yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, I mean, I don't even want to indulge in the argument that the revolution was fought in order to preserve slavery. This is just an outright falsehood. And you see, by the way, what it means in this example of what an unchecked press looks like. It is free to make all sorts of inventions like this, to indict an entire nation. And nobody there even thought, well, maybe we shouldn't say this because other people will think that we are ridiculous. Um, on the other question of slavery as a historical phenomena, look, all of the founders, none of them wanted slavery in America. Not a single one says it. And they all viewed it as a pre-revolutionary inheritance. They inherited this. The British brought it to them. And now they're in, in a way stuck with this terrible institution. And so... At the time, slavery existed in many, many places throughout the world. In fact, as you know, slavery still exists in yes. certain places of the world, which the New York Times is obviously not interested in investigating or condemning. The idea was that the American Revolution would be the first time in human history where the principles of political liberty and equality would create a government. There was no such regime before America, and it would be on the basis of those principles that we would eventually get rid of slavery. And that's what happened. That's how Martin Luther King understood his enterprise through the principles of the founding, that there would be equal rights. That's how Frederick Douglass understood the founding documents, and that's how the founders understood them. All right, so we've got a, about four minutes left here, Arthur, and uh, yeah, you guys do such great work at at heritage about uh, about these very issues and lots of other things too and you know if, if you're really looking for uh good research on all sorts of different topics i, I would highly recommend to everybody that you go to heritage.org first and not just because i briefly worked there myself uh <laughs> about 12 years ago sorry uh, we missed each other yeah well you know i was uh, i was i was doing the remote thing at the time i think it was like in 2005 2006 and i loved working with uh with heritage and it was a lot of fun and um, but but tell me this. I mean, what are your takeaways 
from the American Revolution. I mean, you know, it's it's principles, it's flaws, and and it's transcendent uh, it's transcendent values. <laughs> you got three minutes to, to, to unload yeah. all that. Uh, easy task. <laughs> Books have been written about this, but just give me three minutes and I'll get it to you. <laughs> Look, uh, it was as I said the first time in human history where rational principles, intelligible to all, would be the basis of a new form of government that had never existed before. Slavery was understood to be uh, the normal occurrence of politics and human life. When you look at the ancient texts, Aristotle, Plato, you see that there's slavery there. When you look at the Romans, when you look at medieval Europe, there is slavery always. This is the first regime whose principles were against that and whose principles, as I said, were used in order to eradicate slavery. And many Americans felt the truth of these principles and wanted to abolish slavery. There were huge abolition movements, as you mentioned, mainly Christians, who thought that this was in conflict with the nature of human equality. These people took immense risks to themselves, spent much time in arguing against uh, the institution of slavery, knew that it was a moral wrong. These, by the way, the, the New York Times' goal is to indict not just the founding, but all of the people on the ground in the right. founding. To say that not only is the nation white supremacist, but the people supporting the founding are themselves white supremacists. There were so many people arguing against slavery, struggling against it for many years. It's the only nation that has abolished slavery on the basis of its own principles. I would urge the New York Times to find another example comparable to that. If you want to see a genuinely pro-slavery document, you should see the Constitution of the Confederate States. It unambiguously states that no law will prohibit the ownership of black slaves as property. It says it out, outright. The fact that our, you know, that we are in such a debate today, in my opinion, shows how far away we've gone from being a coherent, stable nation that understands its origins. The fact that such propaganda can be published and adopted by schools so easily shows the extent to which the left thinks of itself, at least, as being on the cusp of a massive victory. I think that's a great place to leave it, Arthur. Arthur Millick from the Heritage Foundation. Thanks for spending some time with us. We're going we're gonna to get you back on and talk more about this because uh, we, we should... We should uh, do a deeper dive on this at some point, but thanks so much for, for distilling that down in three minutes. I, you, I gave you an impossible task and, and, and you just, you just spiked the football in the end zone there. So thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks a lot. Pleasure being with you.